many people. So these things are cheap. This is called the RQ11 Raven. It's a little electrically powered um, uh, UAV. Here's a view uh, from the camera coming out of there. And this is how it works. So there's a, a station. This guy is looking here at a computer screen. This is the camera view. It's got some numbers attached to it. And this is how they get launched. They throw them up in the air and they fly over the hill. And the idea is that a, a patrol of uh, infantry can fly and look over the next hill using this thing. So the problem is, how do they know what the heck they're looking at? And I'll tell you that this is my primary goal in working with the, the military. Uh, my, my objective and why I'm so pleased to be part of the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination is my theme has been tools for thinking. I want to create tools that, people help, that help people think better. And I think we've got to have a smarter military. We make way too many mistakes out there, especially with these kinds of things. If they're, not, if they're confident as you were, that the meeting was on Monday and it really was on Friday, if they're confident that this target is the one they think that that should be and they're not, we have big problems and we've already had big problems with these kinds of systems. I want to be able to design, understand how the brain navigates in these, uh, using these things and then provide better information through that understanding so that we will reward that confidence with correct answers. So as I say, we have the fancy, fancy computer display systems, but on the other hand, these things are also out there guiding. So again, here's this little camera view. You see some buildings, what's over here? What's over here? Is that north? Is that south? This thing's flying and jumping around. A very, very hard navigation problem. So the first question that I've been pursuing on this goes back to our egocentric and allocentric um, uh, study that we I, I uh, was talking about earlier, but now applying it to three dimensions, and this has never been done before. So what we did was create this star field uh, simulation. I, I liken this to the asteroid belt in Star Wars for those those aficionados of you. So watching this one here, you can see the shifting, and this is in the yaw, left and right. And so we do the, exactly the same thing as you saw before. We, we have people watch this, and then they use the laser to point where they think where they came from. But then we go to three dimensions and ask, which way is home when you watch this? So this person's pointing back. So we can have these different modes of, of motion. Um, we can have the egocentric, remember, which is where the world, where you uh, perceive your body moving through the world. Then the allocentric, where you perceive your body um, being part, body itself moving through a fixed universe. And then we can do this in the pitch dimension. So uh, the, the difference here, as we analogously to what we talked about before, is the person upright, they're looking forward, and then they see this visual flow. And do you perceive yourself moving through that visual flow? Or do you perceive the world moving? And again, the referent arrow, which way is home, is either up over your shoulder or down over your shoulder to back to where you started from. So as we were saying a, a moment ago, you feel like, do you feel like you're pitching or do you feel like you're f uh, fixed in orientation and shifting? So here's the answer. What we found was that when we gave people these two tasks and asked them to determine which way they were going, we found that some were purely egocentric. They said, yes, I'm, I'm the one who's moving everything is, and... Um, everything's moving around me. The allocentric is the, mo the world is fixed and I'm moving through it. And then a few people switched modes. Turns out I'm one of the switchers. So I'm, I'm very egocentric in yaw, but I'm very allocentric in pitch. Go figure. So 
there are these different mental navigation modes. And again, remember, that's the instruction that you got uh, watching the tunnel. There is no a priori instruction of which way to, to view this and view your own motion. So we need to understand these things. And here's a perfect example of this. It, um, this is a, um, uh, uh, a, a mock-up of a flight orientation screen in a United States aircraft. Um, and what we see here is the little airplane. So here's the airplane. You can see it's rolled to the left. The left wing is down, the right wing is up. So this shows the egocentric view. Here's the wing is level, there's the ground. Okay? So, um, in the Russian instrument, the ground is stable and the plane is pitched, and that's an allocentric view. Why is this important? Well, um, a Russian pilot with thousands and thousands of hours of experience uh, joined a commercial airline in Russia and started to fly Boeing 737s. And he had several hundred hours flying the Boeing 737 but got into a situation where there was bad weather in an approach close to the ground. And what we think happened is that the, he reverted to his standard mode, his commonly experienced mode um, of the instrument panel, and then when he was looking at the instruments on the American airplane, he responded incorrectly. And so um, the plane spun and crashed, killing all aboard. And this was the result of a, um, a joint invest crash investigation between the Russians and, and the American uh, National Transportation Safety Board. So these orientation uh, modes are, are real and they make a difference. So let's talk a little bit about some brain activities. I'm the brain guy, so we'll talk a little bit about what's going on in the brain with three-dimensional navigation. Here's our goal. What, what I want to do is maintain what's called situation awareness. So the idea here is people are oriented, they, whatever mode they use, they know it and they, they maintain it. And so the idea here is if we're going along in time, the vehicle is moving, 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 and then for some reason the person becomes distracted or loses situation awareness. Uh, if we just keep on going, eventually the, the uh, vehicle becomes unstable and becomes so unstable that it's too late to recover. What we'd like to be able to do is monitor brain signals that say, uh-oh, the brain isn't paying attention to what's going on here. There was another classic uh, crash investigation where three fully trained pilots were looking at a burned out light bulb in an aircraft out of Miami and nobody was flying the plane and the plane crashed into the Everglades with three fully trained, fully conscious, aware pilots but they were paying attention to a light bulb not flying the plane. And so um, can we detect in the brain whether you really are aware of what's going on and if the, the system says this person is not paying attention to what they're doing then you have to get back on task, check, check where you're going, fly the plane, and get back on course before we come, become unstable. So that's our program. Um, so we uh, adapted the, uh, the day of the week problem to a, um, a navigation problem here. So here we see a compass rose with different uh, compass uh, orientations orientations and what we had was the simulation do rotations and translations and then stop and what the person was the task was point which on which uh, cardinal point of the compass which way do you think you're fi uh, pointing and if you're not sure push the lost button now originally when I designed this task I wanted to have lost in a great big button with big red letters and say you're a loser, you don't know which way you're going, and really make it that they didn't want to push that lost button. But ultimately, we just designed it this way. 
Importantly, what we did was we monitored people's capabilities, uh, performance on this task, and literally drove it faster and faster so that they were about 60 per 70 percent accurate on the task. So um, we we monitored to this. Now, interestingly, we had a variety of people, including people in their late 40s doing this task to gamer kids you know, in their 20s as research assistants. And you can imagine there was a wide range of performance capability on the particular task. The gamer kid was like three times faster than us. But again, the system was altered so that it matched their performance. Um, let's see if we can see, make this video go. Is it gonna go for us? I think the link for this one is broken. Anyway, you got the idea. So we also made it pretty simple. If you were within horseshoes of saying correct, then we gave it to you. We said, yeah, um, you could push, you were, um, uh, you were accurate. So here's the thing. Remember, 60 to 70% accurate. Here's the responses. So people push the correct button about 60% of the time or so because we designed the task to be that way. They pushed the last button only 5 or 10% of the time. So they were incorrect. So again, the task is confidently give the answer. Confident, when, if you are confident about which direction you're facing, push that button. So what we see is confident, they were confidently wrong 20 or 30% of the time. They were making lots of mistakes. So we looked, what we were recording um, was electrical brain activity while this task was going on. And uh, from our knowledge of, of brain anatomy, we uh, did a couple of things. First of all, in these subjects, we found that there was lots of brain activity in the mid-posterior. So this is the head with the nose forward, the ears. And so up, back up here in the middle, is, is called the ventra intraparietal area. And it turns out that this area of the brain is this integration area. It brings information from your body, from your vision, from motion sensation, and puts all that together to figure out where you are and where you're going. And so this VIP area um, was active in, all, in, in these patients and or these subjects and made, and which made sense for us. So here's the thing, what we were, that we were able to do then was compare brain activity, and I'll explain what all the funny colors are about in a moment. We compared brain activity to in the correct and the confidently incorrect uh, responses. And so the, the dashed, so this is time. This is slow brain activity and getting faster and faster and faster. And the color indicates how intense that brain activity was. And the button, or the, I'm sorry, the dash line is when they push the button for their choice. So what we see is a comparison of correct activity, uh, brain activity when they were correct, brain activity when they were incorrect. And over here, what's, this is what's called a significance map. So we can, basically a statistical comparison between the two. And what you can see is that even before the button press, there are certain areas, uh, certain frequencies uh, in low frequency and high frequency that tell us, yeah, this is different. There's a difference between the brain activity even before they've made their choice um, in whether they were correct versus incorrect. And so these are the kinds of things that I'm look ultimately hoping will lead us to these brain signals that said, dude, you don't know where you're going. And and then lastly, as many of you may know, the front of the brain is the decision or what's called executive function part of the brain. And we saw a lot of this activity going on in the front of the brain. And we think that what was going on is sort of voting. Yeah, I know where I'm going. No, you don't know where you're going. Yeah, I know where I'm going. OK, we're going to push this button. And we think that's these are the places that we'll be able to find these, these brain activities. So just to finish up here, um, the Wrath of Khan, you know, uh, Star Trek II, um, of course, Captain Kirk, who is, the, if I could be anybody in, in, if I could be anybody, I want to be Captain Kirk.
He gets all the girls. He flies in space. Come on. And he defeats Khan. And, of course, he defeats Khan by remembering that Khan has two-dimensional thinking. So what we, in World War II, we have maps with little uh, uh, wooden symbols for ships and submarines. This is a screenshot of military planning software called Falcon View, which you can, you can um, obtain yourself. Uh, this is three-dimensional planning. Look how complicated this is. Good guys, bad guys, different kinds of information. This is our planned path. You know, incredibly complex information that these military planning people have to execute correctly and make sure they get to the right place. So lastly, we'll leave you with a question. I told you earlier that I'm a switcher. I switch from the egocentric mode to the allocentric mode. And we've had a whole series of debates, and even when our paper was published on this, which has been accepted this year for public, or has been pu is in print now, um, we don't know why different people switch with different modes. Maybe some people who switch modes are a little more cognitively flexible than others, but we don't know the answer to that one. So in summary, uh, we remember we talked about what day of the week is it? Is the meeting Monday or Friday? And that relates to time and space. And now we need to understand about uh, orientation in two dimensions versus three dimensions. Ultimately, is this going to be something that we tr train and select people for? I've had a, a number of discussions with people in special forces who use AV, UAVs, uh, or use drones. Turns out some of those people are just kick-ass operators. They just do it intuitively. And in fact, I, inv I recommend to you that if you go down to Mission Bay on the South Shore, there's an electric aircraft um, model hobbyist field. They're there they're almost every day of the week. But on a weekend, you can watch people fly these model helicopters and it is just amazing what these people can do standing on the ground watching a thing flip and turn and they don't crash them and they're just uh, amazing orientation. So some people have an incredible innate ability to do this sort of three-dimensional work. So we, we want to find those people because I think they're going to be good at this task. And then ultimately we want to augment this by monitoring the brain and making sure that we uh, can provide information to the operator that says, you know, you really, dude, you think you know where you're going, but you don't. So lastly, um, the matrix, you know, we live in an information navigation mode in our world. We use mental metaphors, you know, we use the desktop metaphor with folders and things like that. Is there a three-dimensional metaphor for information and how, it's, and how it's stored and accessed? And how does that get presented to us? Thank you very much. If you have any questions, please send me an email. Um, this is my uh, UCSD email address. <laughs> do you want to take Thank any questions, or should we carry on? What, do you, what would you like to do? I have, a, I have a question. Let's do just one or two questions before sure. we. Yeah. Um, I, I know you all also research about um, uh, motion sickness. Yes, I do. Um, is there a connection between how labile one's flipping b between modes is and how susceptible one is to motion sickness? An excellent question. So the question is, um, if you're prone to motion sickness, does that have any relationship to this uh, motion orientation? And the answer is I, I haven't looked at that specifically, but we, uh, ironically, the posterior po portion of the brain where this information is integrated, we have now detected a motion sickness related signal right there. So my suspicion is yes, they're, very qu they're directly connected. Any other questions? Yeah. Mm hmm. An excellent question. We haven't we haven't studied that, but we would be able to do it much like the uh, the second experiment that I described, make the task faster and harder, and that would be an, a, a very interesting question to look at people's responses and their accuracy uh, to determine that. We don't know the answer to that one at this point, but a great a great idea. Well, and that's a, a big area of controversy in the literature. In fact, we, we had to go through a whole lot of hoops 
because the reviewers of our paper were quite uh, quite opposed. Some people, oh, this is fabulous, and the other, oh, these guys don't know what they're talking about. And um, yeah, so the instructions for these things are, are, are quite important. And as I tried to do here, which is what we did in the experiment, it was not to give instructions, to try and access what you natively or innately would do. Um, my suspicion is that if we were to give instructions, you can kind of force it one way or another, and that may also influence the switchers that we were talked about before. An, an, an excellent question, and yes, and again, that would make a big difference. Um, um, you know, as, uh, ultimately, you learn and you will be forced into these modes, but as we saw with the Russian and American flight displays, there's no a priori uh, requirement to do it one way or another. Um, and and uh, ultimately, what you do is you train on it, and of course, with the with the graspers and things, you get immediate feedback. Here, here we give you no feedback. We don't tell you what the right answer is. The grasper, if you pick the thing up, you're right. So we, uh, you can drive that um, much more accurately. Yes. And the answer is, um, we think that that's the reason for switching modes or people adopting. And as I mentioned, we, there are, are certain tasks by the way that we, we um, cast the task, like tracking a target versus where things are in the world. Now, there's interesting uh, research, and it was even, even done here um, in this particular building where virtual maps were made. And again, it depends on the instruction you give. So. Uh, turns out, for example, that men and women have generally different mental navigation modes that they use when they adopt going through a building. Women tend to use fixed landmarks. Oh, there's that sign, there's that door. Men have more of a mental path that they follow. Um, and they're useful in different kinds of realms. So again, this particular task, so as, we as I just tried to describe, the, the immediate, the target right in front of you is a good egocentric mode. But then if you want to keep track of where you are in the world, then that's not so good. It's kind of the, how did I end up in the kitchen kind of thing? What was I looking for? Great, okay, I think we can have, we'll have some more discussion after the next two presentations. Um, so, Werner. Well, following uh, the drones uh, has been a, and following the future in general, tracking the future has been a very um, interesting thing for me as a science fiction writer. Uh, it's, uh, I think the, the drones um, make a kind of canonical uh, example of the sorts of things that um, um, you almost always uh, uh, find occurring. Um, and that is, even if the components of the, of the uh, new development are all things that people knew about in the past, and, and I think in the case of drones uh, so far, that, that has been the case, the different technological components of uh, dronery uh, are, are th things that have been uh, talked about in the past. Um, even though that's the case, um, the, the way the future actually comes out has all sorts of surprises uh, related to it. And b both for me as a science fiction writer, and I think for uh, actually uh, in anybody nowadays, but certainly people who are in business, trying to find the categories uh, of surprises uh, and identify where th those uh, uh, categories uh, appear is actually very important. Um, in the case of, uh, in general, but in, in, in this case certainly, um, the, the fact of the matter has been that um, certain things turned out to be much easier than anybody thought, or put, put in another put in another way, uh, much cheaper than uh, had been thought. 
and that those things that are, can be done practically or can be done very cheaply tend to skew the application in certain ways. And of course, uh, at the same time, there is the actual market that appears for the different uses. And the, the, uh, the, uh, bet between the two, the market and the price points, uh, you can get the actual skew that uh, makes for the uh, particular developments that you see in the, in, in the real development uh, of, the, uh, of the technology. Now, in trying to apply that sort of general point of view to a partic particular uh, uh, category of development, I think one thing that is helpful b both for science fiction writers who are trying to think of uh, uh, stories to write and uh, developers, uh, marketers, um, or people in general who want, want to anticipate effects, uh, an important, an important uh, strategy to follow is to just do a taxonomy or categorize the different sorts of things that are going on. Uh, once you have something uh, broken down into a variety of different sorts of categories, then you can look at those different categories and imagine uh, if, one, if one thing became much more important or much cheaper than you previously thought. And look at combinations like that and imagine the sorts of things that you could do with each of those combinations. Obviously, that makes, a, makes for a lot of possible science fiction stories. It also has, a, has the effect of immunizing you uh, against um, surprises uh, and perhaps allows you even to anticipate uh, some sorts of surprises. Uh, I know when I was uh, uh, talking to Sheldon about uh, uh, possibly participating, uh, I threw a bunch of questions about, well, what do you mean by drone? Do you mean this? Do you mean that? Do you include this? Do you include that? Uh, and in a way, that is, is, is an example of uh, the, the, the sort of uh, categorization that uh, uh, is, is, is very uh, useful. Uh, I, I, I take a very broad view of, of uh, drones, and I just want to go down through some different sorts of categories uh, that come up and, and how tweaking those categories might result in, in, in different sorts of uh, uh, results. One is um, to categorize things in terms of uh, uh, software-only drones and drones that have physicality. Now, this, uh, this meeting, I think, is entirely about drones that have physicality, but in any, almost anything that humans get involved with, imagining a purely software version of what you're talking about is ultimately going to be something that's pretty uh, important. And in fact, things that are very like drones ha have, have been of importance uh, with co computation and with the internet quite a bit in the past and more so in, in, in the present. Um, the, um, the spiders that are used by search engines, for instance, could be regarded as, as a type of drone. Uh, Going forward, you could imagine types of weapons that basically uh, are code and that is under your um, perhaps real-time control and that is maneuvering around some uh, areas of cyberspace. So I, I actually don't have, uh, I, I am not, not going to have much to say about that here, but I think it's always good to keep in mind that anything that has physicality probably has a worthwhile uh, application of you if you imagine what it would be if it was done purely in software living uh, uh, on the network and in, in computers. So leaving that category aside, there are phys physical drones and imagining the different characteristics that they could have. And, and three big characteristics that uh, we can tweak is the size of the devices, the medium or media through which the devices uh, move, uh, and the speed of, of, of the devices. Size is, is, is uh, I think, one of the, one of the um, variables that has caused surprise with regard to drones. And that is because of, uh, of progress, main, mainly in computation, we can, we can make devices that are doing interesting things that are very small. We haven't penetrated yet how small they could be. Obviously, medical drones that can fly around inside your body are uh, a major and very impactful thing. 
that, are pro that, that is probably, uh, that is already exists uh, and has probably become, become very, very important and is going to turn laparoscopic surgery um, I into the battle of the behemoths. Look, look, uh, that's how we'll look back back on uh, on uh, uh, excuse me end endosco endoscopic surgery, um, where you're just making a little hole and going through with your uh, uh, little cables and camera. That's actually enormous compared to what we what we could have. So that's we haven't we haven't gotten down to the small end of uh, size yet. But one very important thing we're discovering about the size regimes that we are in is the fact that a lot of a lot of physical laws um, um, and physical uh, barriers, impracticalities, become much more much more accessible if you're dealing with small things. Um, for instance, in in the in the next talk, I think you're going to see a demo of some helicopters, and uh, in those they have whirling blades. Um, the blades of almost any helicopter that I could encounter before the year 2000 would have been clear, uh, were clearly deadly to get in the way of. Very, very small, just in uh, the size that, that we're going to see here, um, I, I've been assured are not, are not dangerous to, uh, to, to humans, although I suppose that if you, you got cut in the eye or something, it might be, might be a problem. But they, right there, you have an enormous simplification. You have enormous other simplifications in terms of relative strength. There's various rules about scaling of physical devices um, it's not that ants and small insects are really so very, very strong. When I was a kid, I was told that if, if you were as strong as, as an ant, you could lift an automobile with your two hands. Well, a big part of that is if, if you are as small as an ant, you could do an equivalent type operation. But an ant br brought to be the size of an automobile would not be an especially effective uh, design. So what we're seeing here is a whole slew of things that are possible um, that were not possible before. And the surprises of thinking small, I think, uh, and I'm not talking about nanoscopically small, I'm talking about small on, on, the, on the scale of inches. The, the surprises in doing that, I think, are going to open up new markets and, in fact, will make it more, um, increase the economic drive for getting solutions that work at larger sizes. One of the standing jokes about science fiction uh, has been uh, that uh, you keep promising us these air cars. Where are the air cars? Um, and what we are seeing it with, the, with aerial drones is uh, an explosion in the occupation and use of the third dimension. And I suspect that eventually that is going to become so useful that that plus automation is, is going to give us things that uh, in, in the end are as uh, useful to us and perhaps, perhaps coincident with the notion of, of air cars. Thinking about drones in general in the year 2012, we're generally thinking about fairly small devices, leaving aside, what was the $50 million job that you, Global Hawk? Yeah. yeah. Um, Global Hawk is uh, the, the size of a, a fairly large light aircraft. Um, but that's the, that's the exception for drones uh, that are in service nowadays. Um, on the other hand, there really are uses for large drones. And um, th that, so that's a parameter that has not been exploited at the present time. For instance, you hear a lot about fully automated automobiles, the Google automobile project, for instance. And I think and hope that that's on the way. But there are other things that are sort of intermediate steps. For instance, if you had a small amount of automated smarts in automobiles, why not have, as we do nowadays, as I understand it, with military drones, why not have one taxi cab driver for every five or 10 cars, for every five or 10 taxis? Uh, except for the fact that I would like the taxi cab driver's neck to be on the line as much as me, the passenger, except for little issues like that. It seems to me that there would be an enormous savings in having semi-autonomous vehicles that essentially have a drone manager that is, uh, that is keeping uh, uh, track of them and is, and is taking control when anybody gets in, in a hot spot. So I think we're going to see larger and larger drones um, in addition to the expansion in, in the other direction. The third of, the, of these three performance categories is, was speed. 
And I mean speed in several uh, different uh, ways. Um, we've become somewhat um, acclimated to, to robots and to seeing them move around. Uh, but uh, how many people here have a Roomba as the robot? How fast does that baby move? Okay, so that's a, va a vacuum cleaning and floor washing <laughs> robot. That's the sort of robot that we're presently um, uh, uh, sort of accustomed to. If you go back a long, long way, there was, or if you watch the History Channel nowadays, uh, you can see a show called Industry on Parade, where you get to see what's going on inside modern, that is, excuse me, not modern, 20th century factories, um, where you have devices being made by the hundreds every minute, complicated devices. And generally, you have to watch, you have to watch the devices in the factory in slow motion to even see what they're doing. Like if there has to be a cable wound around an armature or something like that. Generally, that proceeds so fast that if you're just watching it, you can't see anything. It just, boop, the device pops out at the end. Um, those are devices that harken back to the 1800s. Uh, and then all through the 20th century became very pervasive. What I think we're going to see and, and the, the, the variation to imagine is the same sort of speed performance, but for more or less ad hoc events. So um, I think we've all seen these videos of Asimo, the, I think the, the Honda robot, anthropomorphic, and it's moving around fairly slowly. Its idea of running is two or three kilometers per hour. Um, uh, imagine all of those things now, um, that but with the with the articulation that we imagine with, with a human, uh, and with the um, speed that we imagine in those old time uh, setup um, factory uh, production line uh, uh, pictures. That's going to be a very weird thing, and we really haven't gotten gotten there yet. When we do, I think it's going to really raise the consciousness of robotics, that, we'll, that there will be situations in dealing with, with robots and with drones where they'll have to deliberately slow them down uh, in order for the people around them to be comfortable. But that, in general, um, when you ha when there are many, many tasks where um, the tasks themselves are simple, but you have to have reaction times that are on the order of a, of, uh, a few hundred microseconds, few hundred millionths of a second. And for tasks like that, uh, the, the, the robots and the drones are, are, are just uh, ideal. Um, another very large set of categories that we can use when we're looking at these uh, sorts of things is the um, uh, question of the numerosity of the, of the device. Now, by that, I don't mean how many drones are there in Afghanistan or how many drones there are in San Diego County, but I mean how many drones does it take to change a light bulb? Mm. How many drones are dedicated to a particular task? And most of the times nowadays, we're talking about a single drone, now in the, but in the last year or so, we're seeing uh, cases where more than one drone is being operated to do the same task. One of the more spectacular demos that you can see on YouTube nowadays is drones, uh, a numerosity of say five or 10. And the drones are doing a number of things. One thing the drone is doing is just like square dancing, which is very impressive. Uh, and they're flying around so it's in three dimensions, which is even more impressive. But when you see those drones actually cooperating to do a single thing, it comes close to being something new under the sun. And the particular YouTube video I'm thinking about is drones that are making a building. Uh, built, let's say, drones that are making a structure. The structure is made out of bricks. And it's sort of a, a curvy wall. The curve is quite evidently part of the design of the wall. It's not because the drones were making mistakes. And each drone is big enough to pick up one of these styrofoam bricks. And there's a number of the drones working. And so there's just, and I'm fabulating this in part since it's been several days since I've seen the, the video, 
but the drones are just be sort of a haze of things carrying these bricks and, and, and setting them down. They're not actually moving that fast, although if they were moving fast, that would make it even more impressive. And there we get sort of a, a, an interesting notion, and that is that by using the third dimension and by using the spatial distribution of having more than one physically separate device, we actually have something that is, except for maybe army ants, uh, and in some cases termites and wasps, we, ha we have something that's totally alien to us, and that is a robotic agency that is not in one place and that is cooperating through the third dimension. Think back to the 20th century where you have all these stories about robots and all this research done about robots and trying to make robots, I can remember the old time robot arms where there would be all these, all these equations that were solved, obviously, for deciding how to move the arm around so that you could use the degree of freedom that were present in the, in the pincer and in the, in the elbow and in the wrist in order to actually touch what you had to touch, grab it, and change it. And now, all of that, in the case of this robotic cloud, is, is, is replaced by the, using the third dimension and the fact that the devices don't even have to be connected to one another physically in order to do what they're uh, going to do. So between speed and, the, and, and, and spatial separation and the third dimension, you have whole new agencies for how you can do what in the 20th century we imagined with uh, do, doing with semi-anthropomorphic uh, uh, robots. That's sort of the medium scale of numerosity. Um, the uh, the uh, high numerosity uh, robots um, actually bring a, bring a separate world of, of, uh, of uh, possibility. And we're not very close to that in the, in the physical world. By high numerosity, I mean um, uh, in a room like this having thousands of them. The notion of having thousands of embedded microprocessor chips in a space like, that, like this is almost achieved right now. If you took, if you took uh, all, our, all our devices that we have in our pockets, there's probably uh, at, at least 100 CPUs in this room, and I'm not counting in the walls, which uh, end upstairs, uh, which would actually be uh, uh, add to that considerably. But now, now imagine that in addition to being those microprocessors, in addition, in addition to them being networked, imagine also that they have sensors, they have effectors. They can be just simple effectors, like a little pincer or a, a probe or um, a heating element. Uh, and they can move. Uh, at that point, you have a, 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 a situation where um, the world becomes very highly unpredictable, and the, the, even though the individual devices are not very, uh, uh, need not be very intelligent, the overall effect is a, a thoroughly awesome uh, re-engineering of reality, and could, could, could just as well, if it were expanded up to a continental or worldwide uh, range, uh, be uh, uh, talked about as a, as a, uh, a, a sort of a digital Gaia. So I think we have a very large uh, dimension space here to interrogate over the next couple of days. Thank you. Okay, so Werner just set the bar for what we're going to figure out over the next two days, the, the, digi the coming digital Gaia. Um, so... <coughs> Um, do we have, uh, do we want to do a couple questions right now before we swap? Or do you need to percolate on that for a couple <laughs> minutes? Okay, why don't, why don't we let that, why don't we let that uh, uh, simmer a little bit and um, uh, go from that, uh, you know, those sets of visions of where, um, of where we may be heading. Um, to uh, a, a bit more about uh, what what is kind of happening at this moment and and what's about to come in in the immediate future, is that a good enough setup for you, Jeffrey? I think so. I think okay. so. So um, let me plug this in here and verify it works. And uh, where I would. I hear a speaker, Some, a voice com is coming out of from here telling me I need to do something to my computer to get this to work. Um, 
I am still learning how to use Max. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a control panel thing. On the uh, it's a control panel thing, I think. I got it. Okay. Okay. Oh, wonderful. Great. Thank you. So to start out, I would like to uh, um, do a little demonstration of a helicopter that we developed. Basically, it's a toy helicopter we hacked, and this was a project we did for DARPA. Todd Hilton, the program manager, um, is here. Um, but I'll sh I'd like to show, it, show this first just to give a bit of context for later on, and we can fly this a bit more. You can look up to it and play with it and so forth. So what this is is basically a toy helicopter. <laughs> Almost lost it. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> that we did, but uh, I guess to tell you a little bit about, about how I got into this, and, and uh, I'm, I'm coming more from the, the S&T, the science and technology side, but I'd like to start out talking about uh, just a couple minutes how I got into this, what motivated me to, to pursue this crazy direction, and it actually came about uh, when I was an undergraduate, I was interested in this field called neural networks, and some of you may... Um, may remember when that, when that field was, 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 was nascent. And um, the polite thing to say when you're, say, interviewing for a job or, or trying to get funding with a professor and so forth, um, when you're a student is you want to advance the science and technology, you want to advance the state of the art, blah, 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 that type of thing. But really, um, I think, uh, I hate to say it, but I, I think it was more of an alchemistic type of thing. I wanted to be God and create this little life form um, this little artificial life form. And in conversations with other people that go into artificial intelligence or, or areas like that, or even robotics, really that's the same, that's, this, is the, this, is the, this is the same explanation you get out of them after you give them a few beers to drink. Really, they, <laughs> they just want to, they want to play God or they want to, by studying neural networks, they can figure out how they figure themselves out or figure out other people. That, that's, that was pretty much a motivation. And that was my experience um, pretty much for a long time. And then, I, uh, I, I took a position at the Naval Research Lab where I first got into this work. And uh, what was interesting is I, I met a lot of people that were building um, UAVs, drones. Uh, this, was, this was a group in the, of all places, the Electronic Warfare Division. What they were doing was building little airplanes, model airplanes that would fly up and carry a little, basically a transmitter so that when an enemy missile was coming at it, um, this airplane would actually transmit back something that looks like a reflection. So the missile would take it out and leave the ship free. That was the idea. Um, and I remember they, they, uh, the, the people I knew, when they were hired, they were told by the then, the, the higher up people, um, I know we're hiring you to build model airplanes. For God's sake, please don't make them look like model airplanes. But <laughs> that's what they did. But, but those folks, they would basically build airplanes at work and then when, when they go home on the weekend, or in the evening, or over the weekend, what do they do? They build more airplanes and fly them. 
And um, the, the difference, I think, between them and me is here I'm a roboticist trying to be God, trying to, to breathe life into this, this inanimate object. They want to be a bird and fly like a bird. It's, 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 there's a subtle difference, but I, I kind of thought that was interesting. But I think now, um, especially since uh, small quadrotors and so forth are becoming easier to understand, um, those have basically entered the robotics world, and I think the cultures are perhaps going to change again. I, maybe I don't have my, my hand, on the, hand on that pulse, but it'll be interesting to see how that evolves. So that's my little two cents there. But now getting switching gears into the uh, more to the science and technology, basically my obsession for, um, gosh, 15 years has been to develop uh, visual sensing that will let a small aircraft, a small drone, if you will, or a micro air vehicle is what we call them, fly through a cluttered environment, avoid all manners of obstacles, and so forth. And uh, I, I, I got started in this when I was uh, beginning my, my graduate work. Um, and uh, at the time, micro air vehicles were popular at DARPA. That was when the first program was. Um, was kicked off, and there were a lot of people pursuing vehicles, uh, propulsion, aerodynamics, and so forth. No one was pursuing na pursuing navigation, and me looking for a PhD topic said, "I'll do it. Why not?" Um, nobody knew what I was getting into. I didn't know what I was getting into, so they let me. And my advisor was happy to watch me suffer. So, so that that's pretty much what happened. But um, and then with a meeting um, with one gentlemen at, 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 at SAIC, that's a whole other story. Um, if you give me enough beers, I'll tell you that. Um, but he basically said, why don't you look at flying insects? This is back in 1996, and it turns out that the, the, the Journal of Experimental Biology just had a special issue on, on basically animal navigation. I bought it and was pretty much overwhelmed and saw how, how scientists were studying how honeybees flew around the environment and, and uh, what types of visual patterns that they, that they used to figure out where they were, how far they flew, um, what was close, what was far away. Uh, it, I turned out to actually have met a lot of these people later on, and it was just a very fascinating group. But, but why insects? Because their brains are tiny. Um, so how can they do all these things? Um, but if you look at, say, the insect head, basically the, the, the brains of insects are pretty much dominated by the visual system. Um, they rely a lot on vision to keep alive, to navigate, um, to hunt down food, um, in the case of dragonflies. And uh, it, over the years, the, the, uh, the visual system has been studied quite, quite extensively. And I won't, get into the, uh, I won't get into that so much, um, but uh, I'll, I'll talk about one sensory mode that we have spent a lot of time exploring or focusing. And, and uh, Dr. Veer, this, I'm sure you're familiar with this <laughs> concept very well, is the concept of optical flow. And uh, optical flow is the, the apparent visual motion that you experience when you're moving throughout the world. So if you're walking down a tunnel or you're walking through the room, you see visual texture expand in front of you, flow by you, and, and come back together behind you. And uh, there are actually a number of patterns within the optical flow that can tell you about what you're doing and about what is nearby. Uh, just some simple, these are little cartoon figures. So you can envision this aircraft flying over, actually this was supposed to be flying over Mars. There was a time when, when we were gonna fly an airplane on Mars. Um, um, that's another story, another, another two beers, I'll tell you that. Um, but if you envision visual motion in the forward direction, you can see that this is the view from a, a camera on board the air, airplane. In the forward direction, you have an expanding type of pattern. Rapid expanding patterns can indicate the presence of this, this boulder. In the downward direction, the, uh, the rate or the, the rate of the, the motion vectors indicates, say, how high you are or if there are objects sticking up. And this type of, of, of uh, information can tell you about if you're rotating. There are patterns that, that are particular to you moving in place or, I'm sorry, rotating in place, as well as other patterns that are, rel that are relative to you traveling in different directions. And we actually implement um, or, or sense these different types of modes on this, uh, on this little helicopter. But one thing that struck me as interesting from um, all the work uh, performed, uh, all, the, all the work performed studying insects, uh, insect behavior, is that they seem to use elegant uh, and very simple, in many cases, intuitive flight control stratagems, basically little heuristics that will take a visual pattern 
um, or an optical flow pattern and, and transfer that into a response. Very simple rules. If you want to avoid obstacles, turn away from regions where there's a rapid expansion. It, it, it's actually quite intuitive, it makes sense. If you want to fly down the center of a tunnel, equalize the optical flow on the left and the right sides. And uh, this, was, this was actually shown by, by, a, by a colleague of mine, uh, Professor Srinivasan. He's, uh, um, I think now he's in, uh, in Brisbane, um, in Australia, originally at the Australian Australian University. They actually trained honeybees to enter a tunnel um, with a little sugar water, and then over time move the sugar water down to the end of the tunnel. So the, the honeybees knew that they could enter this tunnel, fly down to the end of the tunnel, get the sugar water, go back and, and, and be well fed. But what they did is, is they took one of the walls of the tunnel and let it shift at a constant rate. And the honeybees would actually shift their flight path to, to, to achieve the illusion of both sides of the wall, both, both walls visually moving at the same rate. It was a very interesting revelation. Um, and there are a number of other stratagems that have been observed over, over, the t over time. Um, here we are. So if, if you want to, a simple rule that, that guides you to a perfect landing and this is actually what, what honeybees appear to use, is to continue to approach the ground, but keep the optical flow of the visual motion at a constant rate as you're approach, approaching the ground. And what that does is that basically asymptotically guides you to a perfect landing. And of course, what I just demonstrated right here, if you want to hover in place, keep the visual motion zero everywhere. So what, what was interesting about this helicopter is that it, it did not know its state. All it was doing was trying to keep the whole world steady. And this actually relates this, this, you can see the tie-in with the talk two slides ago. Now on our side, um, as far as how we actually went ahead and implemented these things, I, um, I could talk at length about this um, offline, but we take what I call a vertically integrated approach where, where we've done everything from make lenses and optics to making the image sensor chips to, to uh, building the processing hardware, even in some cases designing the airplane and getting high on glue fumes when we had to repair it. Um, an interesting set of things happens when the same, when, when, when one set of brain is, brains are working on all these different uh, layers. You begin to learn what, uh, you, begin, you, you learn how to control the interface between the different layers. Rather than being confined to some sort of arbitrary industrial standard, you can identify what features are important, augment those, and even better, you can identify what, what features are unnecessary and get rid of them. And that, that's so, so important. Um, I'd like to bring up a quote by, um, I don't know if anyone here knows who Colin Chapman is. Um, he was the founder of uh, Lotus Automobiles, the, the British sports car company. So he, um, and they were known to be sports cars that were not very powerful, but very light and agile and able to humiliate other cars on a track. So he had a mantra that there is really one thing you can add to a sports car to make it accelerate faster, make it brake better, make it handle better. And that one element you can add is lightness. So that's it, basically, this is, this is effectively what, what we were doing. And um, one thing of particular interest is uh, um, these are a number of demonstrations we have done over the years. And it's basically a, 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 a table showing how many pixels we needed to accomplish a task. Um, and what you're going to notice is that this is number of pixels, not number of megapixels. And this is something we've learned borrowing from how insects, basically insect vision systems, is that a fruit fly has maybe on the order of 400 photoreceptors. Dragonfly is on the order of 10,000 photoreceptors, um, 10,000 pixels, if you will. Compare that to a 10 megapixel camera. Um, it's about 1,000 times as many pixels. And we learned, basically, if you want to do some interesting things with, on these air vehicles, don't use any more pixels than necessary. If you have too many pixels, you have too much information to process, and you can't do anything. So you can see here, typically on the order of 1,000 or less pixels, this was an exception, um, down to even eight pixels. We were able to control just the yaw angle, the rotation of the horizontal plane, using eight pix this, this many pixels. Um, I'll just show you a few videos real, real, quick, real quick here, just to give you an idea. This is an early one where we had um, a single optical flow sensor looking downward. Forgive the quality here. This was taken a long time ago. And um, the airplane controlled its height just using the optical flow in the downward direction and using a simple proportional control loop. And you can see right here, we were able to steer it left and the human was, was steering it left and right while the airplane was holding its altitude. Um, 
fun, fun, fun little demonstrations. Um, I learned, by the way, sort of an off comment, is that, is that uh, I live in D.C. We do all this, a lot of this work in D.C. And uh, when we would go to parks in Virginia and Maryland, the police would come and kick us out. Um, in D.C., the police would come and watch <laughs> and leave after we crashed. Um, <laughs> except for the time Marine One flew by. That was another story. Um, so here's, a, here's an airplane. We tossed it toward a set of tree lines that had three little sensors, and it's able to work its way out the corner. Um, here's what's interesting is that here you saw it kind of struggled a bit. It, it flew a few circles before it, 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 it uh, was able to escape. Um, we have a throttle cut off. We learn you have to cut off the throttle, otherwise it'll fly away. Now compare that visually to this particular demonstration about two months later when we actually had the system tuned. Turned away. It's flying more or less straight. Um, it's the next tree line. I was, at this point, I was scared because if it crashed, it would have been difficult to get down. Turned away, turned away again. The throttle cut off, and, and it turns away one more, one more time. What's interesting is that here is actually, um, this is actually a better system, but this one looked more impressive. And I, I just noticed that, that with robotic demonstrations, when it barely works, it looks more impressive than it, when it's working very well often. I, it's, it, I, I just thought that was interesting. So how do we do it on this particular helicopter? Well, very simple. We just measured optical flow in all directions around the vehicle, and we extracted different patterns. Um, and there's, for example, there's one pattern that, that indicates up and down motion. If the helicopter is rising, the optical flow will be downward in all directions. So if you just average up the Y component of the optical flow, you can, you can uh, basically reverse that and use that to control the height. And um, an average of the, of the X direction tells you if you're yawing. And then there are other components, very basic components here. Basically, you can do a dot product of the, of the X component with, with various sinusoid functions, and that can tell you if you're drifting in the, in the lateral directions. What's interesting is that um, in the insect brain, there are actually neurons identified that actually respond to, to these types of patterns. Maybe not these exact patterns, but patterns very much like them. Rotation among different axes or general um, climbing, falling, traveling in, in, in different directions. So, so this is actually somewhat, I like to say, this is actually somewhat, somewhat bio biologically inspired. Um, and I already showed you a couple of flights. This is, I, I just want to show you this little fun one. Um, we were able to do this even in the dark. So the, uh, the helicopter was carrying a few LEDs and we flew it out into actually a very cluttered and messy room. We didn't have a lot of range for this. But uh, so it was able to carry its own illumination and still, and still fly um, and hold a position. Um, it was a fun little, it actually looks pretty cool when you look at it because you see these red lights um, illuminating the environment. Um, but uh, so we're involved with one project um, with the, the Harvard University RoboBee project. And the goal of that effort is to build a robotic bee, pretty aggressive part. And our part is to, is to, make, a vision, to make the vision system for it. Um, and I'm given a budget of 25 milligrams. Um, we're about an order of magnitude away at least. But, uh, but we do have some techniques. We've we found ways to just, um, using techniques that really any hobbyist could, could do we could fabricate a set of optics, about a sheet of them for about $50, and you can cut them up and, and glue them <laughs> right onto the image sensor chip. And basically, it's a pinhole camera with a, um, a refractive layer underneath that, that allows you to get a near omnidirectional, I'm sorry, 180 degree field of view into a relatively small part of the, of, of the chip. And we were even able to, uh, hip means hover in place, um, even able to show, you know, look, mom, no hands, it's flying using just two sensors. And so this is just using two cameras to obtain a near omnidirectional, um, omnidirectional perspective. Um, fun little thing. So, so um, we're trying to get toy companies interested in this. Um, interesting thing. I, I know how to spend an awful lot of money to make one thing. Um, I am still learning how to make a whole bunch of things very cheap. Very different, very different discipline. And there you can see, look, look mom, no hands. So um, this is just a brief introduction, but, but um, I, I, uh, we, we could talk more about this offline, or, or I, I actually I want to leave enough time for the, for the discussion afterwards.
for the panel discussion. Thank you. Um, maybe maybe you just join the panel and we kind of roll sure. into some uh, a bit of questions uh, or discussion with uh, with our group here about these things and um, um, <coughs> and I guess you know it, it's interesting as I was putting this panel together it was clear that I knew exactly what each person was going to talk about because these talks flowed so well together <laughs> um, but uh, but in fact that's really not the case. I only have kind of general notions about what each of these folks are doing. And, um, uh, and there seem, but there seems to be this, you know, these common threads about, you know, how we're, how these drones provoke these questions that we have to ask now about the nature of, uh, about the nature of agency. How do we, how do we know the world? Um, how do we then know to respond to the world around us? And how we start to ask these questions from a uh, from a human centric position, but quickly go uh, to see if there's other ways to ask some of these fundamental questions. Um, so, um, <coughs> a, a interesting kind of a spectrum of how this these problems are being addressed, and how uh, and how this translates into um, to what is going to happen next week. Um, <coughs> so. Um, uh, but and I guess maybe I, I would start by putting one question out. There's a you know a, a thousand of things that occur to me, but um, uh, one had to do with this kind of level of of how much drones how much drones should know, and how that does drive the kind of level of of this kind of scale question um, in with a drone. So in so in the case of just like simply kind of knowing how to get from A to B, um, the level of cognition uh, required to do that, you're trying to kind of, in Jeff's work, you're trying to figure out the, the lowest levels of what that might be. Um, <clears throat> but whether, when, we build, uh, when we build the robo B, um, we may first kind of approach it with the notion that, you know, what, is a, what does a B have to do? Um, but is there also maybe another way of thinking about, you know, what if, what if a bee had the cognitive apparatus of, of the human? You know, can, the, can, can we take the kind of the, the human cognition, and is, and is this the smallest scale that human cognition actually can operate at? Have we already optimized that problem? Um, or when we go to these other scales, do we naturally uh, have to reduce the cognitive load that the energy uh, lift equation kind of allows for. But if then, if then if that's the case, what happens if we go the other direction in the scale? Um, so if our, you know, if we have the, the dirigible level scale of UAVs, are we able to scale up the cognitive load of those machines? So this, maybe this, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm being inspired by, uh, the science fiction vectors that uh, Werner put out there. Um, but I'm curious about maybe if there's some response to this from both these kind of like technical as well as kind of speculative perspectives. Well, if I can, uh, I'm, I'm not a biologist, um, so I might say something, I might say something a bit incorrect, but uh, um, the sense I get, it, it, one, one thing to consider is that uh, when you look at a, an, an organism or an animal, is that it did not come about out of nowhere, it uh, it basically it, it 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 did not evolve in a vacuum. It evolved within an environment, and so um, through through um, many years of, uh, of of natural selection, evolution, etc., the um, I would hypothesize that that the, the visual system and other other sensory systems on on the the insect or the or the, or the animal basically evolved to to take advantage of whatever information is out there. Um, especially in the context of the environment that, that the animal typically thrives in. Um, animals are not like humans. We, we, um, we've solved the, the food problem. Um, animals haven't. They, they have a limited amount of energy. So, so they don't have the luxury of having a lot of extra energy to do all these different things. They, they, need to, they, they basically evolve to, to do what they can with the minimum amount of energy, minimum amount of processing necessary. And I, it, 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 it seems to me um, again, I'm, I'm, I don't want to make a definitive statement, 
but um, they, rather than relying upon, say, one mode or one particular trick, they rely upon a large number of different tricks. Um, each may handle a different type of scenario, and, and, and the sum of the tricks together are what are able to make the animal, um, make the animal live. So that, that, that's, you have to consider that. Now, as far as um, um, when, when, when you say providing human-level cognition to, to I, gu I guess, an, an insect, um, is, is that, or to an insect-sized vehicle, is that pretty much what you were thinking, or? You know, I was, I was maybe just kind of uh, uh, extrapolating from, you know, Werner filling this room with a thousand drones. Um, they're all maybe very simple and maybe collectively have a kind of colony intelligence. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, you know what, what if they're not simple? You know, what if, what if they're actually quite sophisticated and independent actors and to, you know, at making large scale decisions? And, you know, it's a, it's a, maybe it's a science fiction fantasy about a question like that. Um, but as we start to think about, you know, I, I, I was just very interested mm -hmm. in how you were trying to find the most reductive uh, technical solution to, to basic questions, eight pixels to understand pitch or, uh, yeah, I don't remember which well, one. Well, we did that more out of necessity. And, and just what we found is that we actually had gone through periods of time where we had a lot of, uh, we, we succumbed to complexity creep where our chips were getting more and more complex and more and more sophisticated. And was, it, was, it was interesting, um, I, in retrospect, it was actually quite interesting. And there was a time when we were not flying. Um, we were teaming with another entity that was supposed to be flying. And we were just making the sensors. And the other entity never got around to flying it. And what happened is, is we actually made these things more and more complex. And so the, 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 it for, I guess you can think of it as our own evolutionary process. And what made the sensor better was not how well it flew but how cool it was and, <laughs> and, and, and how many oohs and ahs you got from other engineers when you showed it to them doing things. Um, and, and what was interesting was that, it, it, I mean, I, I, to, to credit again Todd Hilton, he's the one that actually pushed us back to flying. Um, and when we started doing that, we realized, wait a second, um, we, built, uh, we built this awesome sophisticated chip that is worthless. Um, and, and, and in order to get things to work, we, we basically we just, we did a rigorous 80-20 analysis and tried to ident identify what were the features that really mattered and what weren't, and, um, and selected just those. And that's, that's effectively what, what resulted in, into this particular system here. So but part of the minimalism, you can, in, in many ways, you can, you, can, you can perhaps think of it as, as uh, in some ways similar to insects having a limited amount of energy. I mean, in our case, we had a limited amount of money. <laughs> <laughs> um, to, to do something, um, and that forced us to really be picky. Um, so if you make, uh, certainly you could make these things more complicated, and I, and I, I um, uh, more processing power, more sensing, certainly with time we can figure out how to use them and how, how, to, how to really use them in, in a wise manner. Um, or, why, or why they might be necessary. Or why they, or why they might be necessary. Um, though, though you kind of, Again, speaking as an engineer, you, you have to be careful to automatically think that, you know, more of this or more of that or more of that is the answer. You have to be you have to be wise in how you use it. Um, so, well, if we obviously if we had more capability, we could we could do more interesting things. Um, probably there'd be a, I guess the question is, um, um, suppose we suddenly had a, a lot more. I mean, a lot. There's like conversations I had recently. A lot more processing throughput, or a lot, a lot more resolution. That could certainly give us a benefit, but it'll also take us time to learn how to use it and how to exploit it. I remember um, uh, Hans Moravec, who's a, uh, a roboticist, but one time he made the comment that um, uh, one reason that he was interested in a mobile uh, robot was that um, uh, he felt that in actually having to do it and, and confront the nature of reality, uh, that that was probably one of the surest paths uh, as processing power became greater, but uh, it was one of the surest paths for finding, finding out what you had to have to make something that had something like a mind, that, you know, interacting with the real problems of um, not falling down the stairs when you're near the top of a staircase would be I important in, in that regard. And in, in fact, I, sus I suspect that things like emotions come down from having to, 
uh, come from having to uh, multitask um, uh, in, in real time a bunch of uh, threats uh, and uh, actually make choices. And, and a lot of the psychopathologies that we're familiar with, like um, obsessive compulsive disorder and various things like that, are really very clearly reflective in, in, in failed solutions to multitasking in real time. So uh, in a way, I, I think that um, a actually confronting reality with our computers is uh, uh, one of the surest research paths to uh, uh, getting fantastic results. So it does also then maybe kind of bridge a question um, that I was kind of thinking about with Eric's work. You know, so you talked about, uh, I mean, you moved from the the way in which we give these drones more individual agency as a way in which they develop mind, as a way in which they develop emotions, that these have a, a kind of dependency that, that has a valuable outcome for them. And, and I guess one of the things that I, I wonder about with the current ways in which like we, we employ drones, um, for instance, in uh, in, uh, uh, in warfare is that relationship, that kind of empathetic relationship to action. You know, so on one hand, there's this risk equation that the, the pilot is no longer a part of. You know, they can fly this drone into this scenario. No one's going to, if they shoot them down, there's no risk to that pilot. Is, you know, what, how does that shift the, you know, the risk equation of the pilot in terms of undertaking that action? certainly seems to provoke a, a, a level of social discord around the Warfare Act. It changes that. Um, uh, and is there a way in which the, the systems that we start to produce for operating drones, in fact, uh, what you may need to add to your uh, neurosensing apparatus is not just a way to read, but a way to kind of maybe direct in so that you actually stimulate the empathetic uh, set centers of, of the brain um, to make the consequences of action kind of more palpable. Well, that's an, uh, an interesting thought, although the reports are now when they look at um, UAV operators that uh, many of these people who are just sitting in a warehouse in Nevada um, are actually developing post-traumatic stress disorder. Mm. And in fact, these people recognize what they're doing in a push-button war. And ironically, perhaps in contrast to, say, a heavy bomber, which works from you know, tens of thousands of feet, these things are much more immediate. And maybe that's mm. part of the idea that um, with the uh, high uh, high resolution sensor and really what you are seeing, you know, you're reading the license plate or you're looking in somebody's backyard, mm. um, that you recognize the human act that you're carrying out um, mm. in that case. And as I say, the, these operators are uh, are reportedly experiencing some level of stress disorders and things like that because of the nature of the work that they're doing. So. Um, perhaps the fidelity is part of the is part of the equation. You know, if it's um, just some longitude and latitude where you're going to put this thing, that's one thing. But if it's somebody's backyard and there are people there and you can see them, that's a different story. Right. And so, um, ironically, perhaps uh, points to the humanity of the people that are doing these things that they they recognize. And this, which gets to again my uh, comment from my, my lecture about creating a tool that people um, understand better, they understand the nature of what's happening, they understand where they are, and also, as we discussed, um, trying to make sure they're not making mistakes. Um, it's one thing to, uh, to go after Osama bin Laden, but you know the guy in the next house isn't him. And so um, you better be sure where you are. Questions, yeah.
for sure. I, I, I quite agree, and I, uh, um, I don't think you can train that out of people altogether, um, which is which is probably a good thing. You know, there's studies about in um, this is still people with with manual weapons, and they have to be there physically too. They, they, uh, a lot of them never fire their weapons. It's a fraught problem, um, something that we're paying for. And as I say, I'm, I'm hoping that we're training people uh, to be more intelligent and understand the task that they're, they're being asked to carry out, especially if they're, if they're doing things that they shouldn't do. Yeah. Well, and, and an important question, it was interesting that uh, I noted that with the recent massacre in Afghanistan that one of the uh, commentators that came out immediately said, and I, and I quote, there are sociopaths in the military. And um, that's unavoidable, you know, it's a force of hundreds of thousands of people. Some people get through the screens screen for these kinds of personality problems and then people are trained and monitored but they don't pick them all up so it's a it's a, uh, it's still a, a fraught problem yeah I don't do that kind of work. Um, I'm sorry, I don't do that kind of work. Um, and the question was about um, recognition of uh, what the target is, um, to be blunt about it, um, or who the target is. You know, that's an intelligence problem, uh, a, a military intelligence problem. Um, but people are studying how the brain recognizes who or what they are looking at. So those those uh, larger um, cognitive issues are being studied as well. That's not particularly part of my own research. As I say, just navigation is, is a big enough issue, although it's uh, going back to your comment about uh, putting higher cognition into these things. Well, it's been done. He did it. He put his brain, his equations into that thing. Mm. And I think that's pretty cool. So I hope that uh, better recognition systems, and, and I think it's really going to be interventions are you really asking, you know, are you doing the right thing, you know, um, a, um, um, as, a, as again in the military so often, um, a joint decision, doesn't have to be a large group of people, but just two people, is this, are we really where we're supposed to be? So the question becomes, is the drone the other part of the equation, you know, um, is, the, is an artificial intelligence uh, that somehow designed to recognize our own failures and limitations, um, but taking advantage of what we do well, uh, put the two together and make hopefully make better decisions and make fewer mistakes. Mistakes will still happen. Yeah. Um, again, that's not something of my own sp specific research, but there, are, as you well understand, there are um, many, many uh, research studies on multitasking, and we don't really do it very well. We think we do, and 
my 13 year old daughter thinks she can do her homework and and play video games at the same time, but she can't really quite do that. So we gotta we gotta turn the games off at the same time as she's doing their computer based homework. Um, so it's uh, the divided attention and and the decrements of performance are a big big issue, and have really been um, a part of human factors research for 50 years. Good. Um, yeah. Well, like, like insects, we are highly visually dependent. Um, uh, so certainly other cues are used. We were talking earlier about how we could use this um, um, sensing system actually for humans. Um, in, For example, in my patients who have lost balance. So one of the, um, uh, one of the cool technologies in balance function is what's called a tactor, which is a, a vibration sensor, just like your cell phone, except that it's attached to different parts of your body to give you different uh, awareness um, of direction. And people can literally fly planes bi blindfolded by having these tactors um, plumbed into the, um, into the aircraft orientation systems. So uh, multiple senses are, make a whole lot of sense. We, uh, as I say, there's a huge there's a huge computational overload to, to vision, but uh, lots of benefits to it. Um, and I've done a lot of work in virtual reality in the past, and uh, multiple sensory modes are absolutely something that have been uh, looked into. There were very, very serious efforts funded to look at smells. Smells as a stimulus, going back to the emotional uh, uh, thing that we were commenting uh, a few moments ago, smells are incredibly emotionally evocative and make a huge difference on your general emotional state. Um, and so even though they don't have all the high resolution, they can make you think differently. Um, so uh, multiple sensory modalities, uh, as I say, vibration over your body, uh, three-dimensional sound, as well as a vision are for sure. But ultimately, it becomes a thinking problem. And ironically, I don't know that we've really got a good handle on thinking so far yet, but we're working on it. I think there's a, uh, th there is a, something that is going to turn out to be quite important, but that most people, inc including me, have, have regarded as, as cheating in the past uh, about, about this issue with sensing. And that is, um, if the environment is prepped, um, there's a lot of things that are going on now that wouldn't have to car carry any mass payload at all. Um, for instance, if you're in a prepped environment, by that I mean an environment that, that has c cooperating physical characteristics, um, then, for instance, position could, 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 could simply be uh, obtained from, from looking at the environment. GPS is a perfect, and uh, not a perfect example because it's very low res, but uh, something like GPS, which you could imagine installed in, in areas that's built up as a, as a UCSD campus, uh, could give you sub-centimeter resolution, which and this does not mean that all of this is not important, but it means for those particular applications, that just uh, is, is, is not mass you have to put on, uh, on the vehicle. And one reason I always deprecated that in the past it, it was because I regarded it as, as cheating. Um, but then I thought that, that actually, uh, uh, in a way, that's what the real biological world is, is like, that every biological creature uh, b besides leaving aside the predators it has to deal with, um, is, is using, is absolutely dependent on the prepped nature of the reality around it in, in terms of cues, including, including smell cues and things like that. And that um, when we prepare an environment like putting on laser reflectors in the environment or putting on uh, location detectors in the environment and things like that, we're, we are really just providing the machines with, the, with they're an analog of the things that we already have because of uh, several hundred million years of, of, um, of e evolution. 
So it's going to be uh, interesting to see how how prepped environments, uh, you know, evolve along with all these other issues. Well, yeah, I, I, I might oh. just it provoked a thought. There was a really neat story um, about a research study uh, from Texas a few weeks ago where they were looking at the basic centers of the brain. Um, I'm trying, I think it was in birds, and were able to demonstrate magnetic field receptors and so or magnetic the orient cells that could tell the orientation of a magnetic field in other words something that was a basically a system-wide compass in other words there wasn't a compass needle necessarily they found in the brain but they found the sensor that said which way north was and they rotated the magnetic field around the experimental animal and they and the cells responded to that magnetic field change and so I was really interested in that because um, there was then a story about birds landing on a bird feeder. And this guy was watching it and he said, you know, every day, they, this was a car talk thing. The guy was watching the birds and they would come at the bird feeder in different directions. And then he went outside and figured out why. And it was that on different days, the wind was in different directions. And as an airplane, as a pilot, we always land downwind. You land into the wind because it slows your relative speed over the ground. So I wanted to go to these bird guys and say, look at where's the airspeed indicator that goes <laughs> along with the with the ground speed indicator and uh, the compass orientation to tell you which way downwind is because they got to figure that out. So they got to know their airspeed and then the optic flow and figure out which is minimized and then they can they can land into the wind. And um, uh, so there there's. There are these kinds of senses in our body. There are multiple, multiple senses, not just the six we learned in the high school textbooks. But it, it also occurs to me that one, one aspect of what you're talking about is this relationship to how the system or the organism evolves in relationship to how it evolves and changes the world that it inhabits. And so that this is, again, a kind of ecology. And so, uh, you know, and, and ecolo you know, so the components of what the ecology of our droning, you know, droned condition might be will, of course, rapidly change. But I was even struck by your demonstration of your pinhole cameras uh, to keep the drones and that you were flying in front of a curtain that was like a curtain that a computer, uh, the cu a curtain that would belong to a computer vision researcher. <laughs> It, it looked like it was, you know, targets, spatialized <laughs> targets. And, um, you know, so there is this notion that, you know, how do, we, how do we change ourselves if we recognize that, you know, that we have these autonomous vision systems that are trying to look at us? You know, how do we become both even kind of more desirable or more elusive to these kind of sensory systems? And so we start to become, transform the world around us to be, more amenable or more confounding to this kind of drone autonomy. It's a well, example. Well, I was going to say, as a native Canadian, I was also impressed that your your uh, vehicles flew in the snow, and, <laughs> and I could figure out where it was in a snowy landscape too. Well, the ca the caveat for that is that the, the, these, uh, the, these these the image sensor chips are silicon with no IR filters, so they do sense a bit mm. in the near infrared, and there could be some texture going on there that that we that, that we can't see. So that's the caveat. I, I don't know if that's the case or not. Um, I, I did want to point, it, it sort of just to thought off the top of my head, but uh, in the earlier discussion about effectively setting up the environment to cheat to make it easier for to, to do for us for, for drones or robots in general to do something. Um, it might be interesting to see. I don't. I wonder if anyone's ever studied the history of something as mundane as the, the markings, the line markings in the road, mm. that uh, that help humans drive a car and stay on their side of the road, not veer off, especially when there are a lot of turns and curves. How much do humans rely upon those lines versus just looking at the road? It's just something off the top of my head, but that might. Be oh no, for sure. And so we, yeah, we mark up the world for sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so. Um, I want to try and get a sense of uh, this has been a terrific discussion that will continue. I um, uh, want to try and keep us a little bit back on a schedule um, so that we're not here till 2 a.m. Um, uh, we have this seven-minute film. Uh, the, the length of the film keeps 
shrinking uh, as I hear <laughs> more about it. Um, <laughs> it's a trailer. OK. <laughs> Uh, is the sense that we should watch this now and then break for lunch? Yeah. Ricardo, you we're going to vote one way? Uh, raise your hand if you like Jordan, you've been overruled. <laughs> OK, so um, why, don't we, uh, why don't we break the panel off the stage and get, out of the, get our heads out of the way of uh, watching this seven minutes uh, trailer? Um, everything Sorry, what? that is there at this point is muted. Yeah, tip your mic. You can talk to the mic. That, that is really a mute. It's, not, it's yeah, not, not a computer. No, that's a person sitting there. Cool. Cool. Yeah. 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 Maybe you could fly the drone sure. around the screen <laughs> during the middle of the movie. And do we want to? Do you do you want to introduce this at all, or is self-explanatory? Uh, well, John Bosch is here. John Bosch. Oh, oh, John, you are here. Come on. Hi, I'm John Odom from Altman Focus. We make uh, documentary films, and we're based here in San Diego, a nonprofit organization. And uh, the preview uh, is for a film called Drone Wars we're working on. And it talks about the ethical and political aspects of drones. Right now, we have 5,000 of these drones in the air, 12,000 on the ground. One of the reasons for the development of this technology has been to avoid disturbing the peace of mind of the American people. No casualties. Invisibility. Nice. And precisely because it's accurate, it gives this illusion that it is also going to target the right people. This presentation demonstrates a prototype of the ethical governor, a key component in the ethical projection of unmanned autonomous force. Like, um, I, I was digging around and found these uh, research papers that they were doing in, uh, in America. In, you know, and they had this program called The Ethical Governor, which I found quite interesting. I mean, I thought the title was great. And uh, it's just the, the fallacies involved, you know, how, you know, how, how actually could you have a, um, you know, a code of ethics that, um, that governed your machines that are, you know, basic purposes to um, kill people and uh, destroy property and infrastructure. You know. A world-class decision matrix collates the key factors. These are choice of weapons, sustainable losses, both organic and financial, and full legal protection for all elements in the chain of command. With no human interference, the final release position is selected, the target neutralized, and the medical facility remains intact. But the, the great thing about the, um, the ethical governor is we've got this module called the ethical adapter which means that you know, if any of these rules are kind of bothering you or, or proving a barrier to action, you can just ignore them. It's got a sort of manual override, which is, you know, that, that's the best kind of ethical code anyone can ever have. You know, one that sort of gives you strict guidelines, but you can ignore them any time you like. You know, so I think, um, I, th I think that that's the best, that's the best kind of ethical code to have, you know, because you don't want to be hampered by by uh, you know, sort of uh, nice, quaint, quaint conventions, so, as as the as they called the Geneva Convention uh, those those years ago. 
This is the scenario which shows the ethical adapter coming into play. You can clearly see this um, terrorist lurking behind this wall in what's clearly labelled as a civilian area as these uh, two um, swords robot uh, ground drones are approaching, completely unaware of what's in store for them. Who is aware is the uh, drone helicopter, which even though it can help them, is at the moment um, disabled by the ethical governors. Uh, it's, it's reached its maximum guilt quotient, so it's, it's, it's actually unable to open fire. So uh, e even though these uh, two robots are clearly in harm's way. So this is where the ethical adapter comes into play. As soon as, um, as, soon as a scenario like this emerges, the ethical adapter allows this, um, this helicopter to overcome its uh, feelings of guilt um, and reset itself to factory um, settings and, um, and uh, go into action and uh, open fire on this, um, what is clearly a bad guy, you know. The Jonas Brothers are here. They're out there somewhere. Sasha and Malia are huge fans, but uh, boys don't get any ideas. I have two words for you, predator drones. <laughs> you will never see it coming. You think I'm joking? Obama, who has been targeting terrorists in Pakistan, Yemen, and Somalia, even killing U.S. citizens, has just authorized an expansion of bombing raids wherever there is suspicious behavior at sites known to be controlled by a terrorist group. These are illegal. The drone attacks have been illegal all along. The assassination, assassinations of anyone have been illegal because under the Geneva Conventions, and the United States is a party to the Geneva Conventions, targeted or political assassinations, sometimes called um, extrajudicial executions, constitute willful killing. And willful killing is considered to be a grave breach of the Geneva Conventions. If, if you're a true human rights activist, you're going to want to spare American military lives, not just our enemies' lives. So I think uh, that uh, drones are good for what they're used for right now. I mean, this is the, this is the uh, wave of the future in weapon system te technology. Why not keep young men and women safe, um, but, but still main maintain the uh, humanity of a human pilot on the ground safely flying one of these unmanned aerial uh, weapon systems? You know, I understand the military position in the sense that when we use drones, no Americans get killed. Thank goodness for that. I'm absolutely in favor of doing everything to preserve American life. And I hate to think of our military being sent into dangerous places and getting themselves killed. But what you've got to think about is, is what we're doing actually making us safer? Or is this just the Obama administration's way of pretending to act tough, while at the same time actually making our world a, a less safe place? And my experience in Pakistan teaches me clearly that what we're doing up there in Waziristan is making us less safe. It's aggravating everybody and it's not solving any problems.